Hi there, and welcome to this talk as part of the Cloud Lunch and Learn Marathon. We'll be talking all about how GitHub can help in building and deploying a podcast or a blog site to Azure. My name is Chris Reddington. I am a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. And one of the things that I do in my spare time is I enjoy doing blogging, podcasting, vlogging, and contributing back to the community. And the way that I do that is I do that on my website, cloudwithchris.com. So in terms of this session and what we'll be focusing in on here, we'll be focusing on four particular areas. First, being able to identify the core features of GitHub. Secondly, being able to understand the fundamental concepts of GitHub Actions. Thirdly, being able to locate existing samples to help you deploy to Azure. And then finally, maybe most importantly, understand how and why I deploy cloudwithchris.com with GitHub Actions. So let's waste no time, let's jump straight in. So let's start with a bit of history and a bit of scene setting. GitHub was founded back in 2008, so it's actually not that recent. You know, it's been around for quite some time. A lot of people think GitHub is this very modern, very new platform, but actually, it's been around now for about 13 years. And Microsoft itself became a big user of GitHub back in 2012. When you think of some of the projects that Microsoft now hosts from an open source perspective on GitHub, things like VS Code, things like .NET, for example, the Roslyn compiler, lots of these were big, big strategic shifts for Microsoft as a company to focus on open source. So GitHub has always been this company that has focused on open source, and you can see that through its entire history. And in 2018, Microsoft bought GitHub for $7.5 million, so uh, a very big acquisition and a big investment there. And what you can see is this investment in open source really continues on after Microsoft's investment. So January 2019, is when GitHub started offering unlimited private repositories to all plans, including free accounts. And that is something I was very grateful for. I'm sure many others listening in here were grateful for that as well. Uh, then in September of the same year, they acquired a company called Semmel, which we'll be covering again a little bit later on here. And then March 2020, GitHub announced they were acquiring NPM. And then later on in 2020, April, they announced that uh, the free plan would allow unlimited collaborators, but private repositories would have a limit of up to 2,000 minutes of GitHub Actions per month. So again, what you can see is this appreciation of the open source community. Yes, there's this introduction of these private repositories, but ultimately that love and that investment keeps going back to open source. Now let's just think about GitHub for a moment and pay particular attention to the diagram uh, or rather the image on the right hand side there. GitHub is this platform which is really focused on making you as a developer productive. So it's not just about Git, it's not just about version control. GitHub is so much more. So if you've never used GitHub before, you've heard of it but you're not quite sure what it is, you may be familiar with Git as a version control system. And that's where GitHub started as a host for Git repositories and having these additional aspects like issues and all of this kind of project management functionality. But now it's a much broader platform. When you think about what we mentioned earlier, the SEML acquisition, for example, GitHub is really investing in the DevSecOps space. When you think about tools like Dependabot, which automatically go and manage your dependencies, when you think about, for example, CodeQL and the ability to query your code for vulnerabilities, there's some really fascinating and strong investments being made by GitHub there. So GitHub is a platform much broader than just the initial version control offering that it was really focused around. Yes, that's a great aspect of it, that social experience of coding and that open source experience. But now with the introduction of things like GitHub Actions, for example, and these introductions of uh, security offerings like we've just mentioned, GitHub Mobile, you can see it's really becoming this 
platform as a hub for all of my development needs, not just focused on one particular area. So we're going to be focusing particularly today on the repository side of things, the coding aspects, GitHub Actions or the CI CD aspects and automation. And then also we're going to be focusing a little bit on uh, GitHub issues, project boards as well. And we'll also have a quick look through the uh, GitHub code spaces aspects as well, as uh, there's quite some interesting things there. Now, let's focus on cloudwithchris.com as a project for a moment. My website, my blog is a static website. So it's all made up of static content. So think about things like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, all of these things, for example, is what my website gets compiled into. There's no dynamic uh, content, you know, there's no server underneath being uh, rendering this content live on the fly. This is all pre-compiled and built ahead of time using a static site generator. And the generator that I particularly use is one called Hugo. And there are many others out there like Jekyll, Gatsby, Viewpress, and others. But I'm going to be focusing on how I use GitHub Actions to build, deploy, develop my site itself. So just so you know, it is using Hugo. That is the tool that I've chosen here for uh, my particular site. Now, in terms of the architecture itself, it's actually a very efficient and cost-effective architecture. Most months, I will pay less than five pounds, UK, British pounds, every month for all of these environments that you see on screen here. And that is including my streaming of my podcast to services uh, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts as well. So a really cost-effective method of deploying my website through this architecture. So three main components. Azure DNS is how I manage my domain names. So my dub, 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 my staging, my main uh, Apex domain, my podcast subdomain, and my preview subdomain as well. Now, all of those individual endpoints point to an Azure CDN profile. And I use the Microsoft CDN uh, offering as part of the Azure CDN there. And then behind the Azure CDN, the origin, if you like, for each of those endpoints is an Azure storage account. Now, all of those, uh, except the podcast subdomain, uh, use storage accounts with the static website functionality. And then the podcast one is just a normal storage account holding blobs in it. So actually, there is an elephant in the room here because there is now this service in Azure called Azure Static Web Apps. And actually, a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today, Static Web Apps goes ahead and does that and manages that for you automatically. It can go ahead and make a GitHub action for you. It can deploy things like Hugo and other static site generators to your endpoint in Azure if you wish. So I started building this site before Static Web Apps exist, but it is a brilliant offering. And if you're starting your journey, it's definitely worth taking a look at and investing in because it has a lot of functionality that can help you with some of this that I'll be talking about today. So with that, let's move over and jump ahead into some demos and see what's going on here. So let's, with that context, now look at GitHub and how I actually use GitHub as part of that overall flow. So you can see here that I've got this GitHub repository, github.com slash chrisreddington slash cloudwithchris.com. This is where I host all of my code for my blog, my theme, uh, the contents of the episodes themselves, even my podcast audio files as well. And that's something we might touch upon in a little bit during this talk. Uh, but a few aspects that are worth calling out about GitHub in general first. So of course we have the GitHub repository. That's Obviously, one of the things GitHub is known for with uh, Git itself, the version control here. And you can see all of my files are listed here, all of the different aspects that uh, we would expect to see, like the branches that I have access to, uh, the history of changes, for example, the last commit that took place, for example, etc. Now, if I navigate to this next tab along issues, what you will see is a set of 
effectively lightweight tasks that uh, I've gone ahead and created in my repository. So this is actually how I go and manage my entire backlog of work, whether that is episodes, whether that is blogs. Uh, this is how I go ahead and manage and maintain all of that. So if I wanted, I could go and click on one of these labels, for example, and it goes and filters down for me based upon uh, the type of content that we're talking about there. If I get rid of that filter and maybe look by another filter, for example, so let's look at cloud drops and maybe uh, look at milestones coming up in this month uh, that I'm currently recording in April here. What you can see is, uh, of course, uh, I can see what's coming up in April. So that's all good. But what if I'm more of a visual person? Well, that's where project boards come in. And project boards are similar to that kind of Kanban feel that you might be used to. So as an example, I can go ahead, drag and drop these, go from to do to in progress to done. And all of these items, don't you worry, I have not added them manually. Just keep in your mind what we said about GitHub Actions, that it's automation and CI CD. So we'll come back to that in a little bit here. But ultimately, these are the tools that you can go ahead and use to go and manage some of your work inside of GitHub. So now that we've planned the work, we actually want to go and start developing on it now. So we've obviously got our code here and we've got a couple of options that we can take. We can go ahead and we can go and click this code button and then we could go and open with GitHub desktop. We could go and clone that repository if we like. But I have another option, and this next feature that I'm going to show you is currently in beta. And if you want to go ahead and access that, you have to go and request early access and join the waiting list for that. And that feature is called GitHub Code Spaces. Now, GitHub Code Spaces, if I go and create a new one here, effectively is an environment that is spun up and run as a container over in GitHub. And then what we can do is we can connect to an environment that looks and feels like Visual Studio Code, but is running in a container on GitHub. So if I just show logs here, what you'll see is I have this option to go ahead and uh, build this container and then run this container. And that's effectively what is happening when we go ahead and spin up this GitHub code space. It's just building and running a container that we can connect to over in GitHub. So why is this all important? Well, if I switch my tab over here, you will see that all of this is just like a Visual Studio Code environment. I'm going to bring my mouse up just so you can see this is a web browser and everything is running in my web browser here. So I can go ahead, start editing my files. Maybe I want to go and update an episode, for example, and we make some changes there. Now, if you think about those scenarios where you've had to go ahead and set up an entire development environment from scratch, it takes a lot of time. You've got to install dependency after dependency. And when you think you're done, then you get conflicting frameworks or something else. It can be painful, especially if you're setting up a brand new machine, working on different operating systems or different machines. What if you just wanted a quick way to be productive? This is where GitHub Code Spaces comes in. Now, you may have noticed in the GitHub repository that we looked at earlier, there was this .dev container folder. Now, if we zoom in, there are these two files, a dev container.json and a Docker file. And the Docker file is that Docker image that is built effectively and ran for our uh, code space environment. And then this dev container.json is a little bit like a manifest, if you like, for what we expect that overall environment to be what extensions we'd like to see in there, the type of uh, shell environment we'd like to see, any post command scripts that need to run, etc. And then what results is the environment that we're looking at right here, right now. And the beauty of that is I can go ahead and use things like the terminal that you would be used to in VS Code. I can go ahead if I just click up there, you can see some previous commands that I've run when I've been in that container previously. If I go ahead and run that, what you'll notice if I navigate over to my ports is I have this running process here. So I can go ahead, click on this open in browser option. And what you will see is my browser will now connect to a forwarded port 
from that code space instance. So that is actually the website running on that container over on GitHub. It's not my preview site, it's not my staging site, it's not the production site. This is my inner loop of development, me being super productive, able to go ahead and make changes locally effectively and see them locally. Obviously it's not local, but you get the idea there. So if we just navigate back, one of the things about that endpoint as well is it private by default, but you can go ahead and change that if you like as well. Um, so that is another great feature just to go and look at if you're wanting to collaborate and work with others, for example. So that's actually how I develop my site and how I keep all of my changes going there. So let's jump back and take a look actually at the uh, environment itself there, my uh, GitHub repository. So we're just going to hit back here and navigate out of the GitHub code space. Now, you'll notice on the top here, one of the tabs that I have access to is GitHub Actions. And inside of GitHub Actions, there are these series of workflows. And if you've used a tool like GitLab or Azure Pipelines or Jenkins, you might be familiar with the concept of a pipeline. And effectively, these workflows are similar to pipelines. It's the same kind of concept. This is the generic uh, pipeline definition or workflow definition, if you like. And then these on the right hand side are all of the instances of that particular workflow, that particular pipeline running. So you can see, for example, one of the workflows that I have is adding an episode to a project board. Remember what I said earlier about I don't add all of those episodes to the project boards manually. I use a GitHub action to do that. So spoiler alert on something we'll see in a moment. So we can go ahead, we can go and look at any one of these individual runs. Take a look, for example, at the logs, see what happened in there. And we get a lot of great information. But how does that all work? Well, there is a convention inside of GitHub to go ahead in this .github folder, creating a workflows folder, and you have a series of YAML files over here. Remember what I said earlier about the static web apps? Well, when you create a static web app, one of the options you have is creating a GitHub action for that static web app. And you can see here, this is the actual YAML file generated by static web apps by default here. So some great functionality that makes that overall static web app service really powerful and really valuable there. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, that wasn't available when I started creating my site. So this is where I've gone ahead and created a series of my own GitHub actions to go and drive the deployments into Azure storage. So as an example, what we'll see here, if we look at my master workflow is I push on a branch to master. I ignore any changes that happen in the podcast audio folder. Any other folders will trigger a change. And I have two main stages in my jobs. The first one is a build. The second one is a publish. They're just names that I've given those stages. Then we say what we want the run agent to be or the workflow uh, actually to be run using a GitHub runner. We have a series of steps. And then those steps have these uses, some commands, etc. there as well. So let's go ahead and just take a look at some of those pieces in a little bit more depth here. So number one, with GitHub Actions, you're not just limited to the typical CI, CD triggers. And when we say CI, CD, we're talking continuous integration, continuous delivery or deployment. So those are typically things like on push to a repository, when a pull request is created or deleted, uh, for example, when there's a commit on a particular branch of the repository. But you are also able to automate based on events from GitHub. So has there been a new item created in GitHub issues or deleted or updated? Has there been a comment? Has a project board been closed or updated? Uh, you could do that on a particular schedule, for example, as well, like every day, every week, every month. So you're not just limited to the typical CI, CD aspects. Now, when you look at this particular file here, you will see that there is this runs on property and we have this option for Ubuntu dash latest. 
Now, GitHub offers multiple runners. If you've used a service like GitLab or Azure DevOps or others, uh, you may be familiar with the term runner, you may be familiar with the term agent, and this is effectively what it's talking about here. And what we're saying in this particular line is that GitHub Actions offers a number of hosted agents available that you can go and use and has a number of tools pre-installed already. And of course, if you need to go and access something private and deploy somewhere private, you can absolutely go ahead and self-host those runners as well if you need. Now, the next point, take a look at these two lines down here that say users. And there's this action slash checkouts at V2, GitHub slash super dash linter at V3. Do you notice anything interesting about their naming convention at all? Maybe you got it. Hopefully you did. If you did, congrats. Well done. Is that this is actually the naming convention of a GitHub repository. So action slash checkout. If you go to github.com slash action slash checkout, what you will see is a GitHub repository. And if you look in the tags underneath that repository of the releases, what you will see is the V2 tag will point to a certain commit in the repository. So all we're saying when we reference these actions is actually, hey, GitHub Actions, go and pull in this repository and this particular version of the repository and go ahead and execute that action with these particular parameters or these particular properties. And that's the magic behind GitHub Actions. All of these actions are just other repositories. So there's a lot of power behind that because you are now able to go and use these actions which are other github repositories they might be on the github marketplace but something to bear in mind is that anyone can of course publish one of these repositories so like you would be i don't know like you would be mindful of your packages that you bring into your code also be mindful of the actions that you bring into your workflows as well and make sure that you trust what is actually in that code and now for a couple more observations. Notice that we have another stage here called publish. And underneath that publish stage, there is a property called environment with a name. Well, this environment name maps back to a value in our GitHub repository. And we'll take a look at that in a little bit. Now, what this gives you is the ability on a given stage to have manual approvals and also to bring in re repository secrets which are scoped to a given environment. And those secrets will only be pulled in if that environment is used and if that environment is referenced. So those secrets won't be pulled in unnecessarily. Now notice once again that we've got these actions slash download dash artifact and Azure slash login. These, once again, are just GitHub repositories. You can go and see the code in them. Some of them uh, will be built using these JavaScript type workflows or JavaScript type actions, I should say. And some of them will be written using Docker files. So again, take a look in those repositories because you'll start getting a sense of how these actions actually work. And then finally, if you need to reference anything that needs maybe to be evaluated at runtime, what you could go and do is use this dollar curly brace curly brace syntax. And that is how runtime values are effectively evaluated. So in this example, we are referencing a secret called Azure underscore credentials. So let's go back and with that knowledge, take a look at some more GitHub actions. Okay, so now that we've set that context, let's go and look at a couple of other things here. First off, before we take a look at some of the environment pieces, I just want to draw your attention to this security tab and remember what I've been saying about GitHub's investments in security. Well, this is where you can go and set things like Dependabot alerts, security advisories if there's any known vulnerabilities, for example, for the packages you depend on, and also for code scanning as well, like CodeQL. So again, if you're not familiar and haven't looked at some of the investments that are available as part of GitHub and its security functionality, go ahead and take a look at that because it's very, very powerful. Now, remember when we looked at that example of GitHub Actions earlier, 
we saw that there was this preview.azure and production.azure environments. Well, inside of your GitHub repository settings, you have a couple of choices that will be interesting for you on the left-hand side. One is for secrets, and these secrets are the overall repository secrets. And you also have access to environment secrets, which you can access in environments as well. So I've been deploying my sites to a number of different environments. So you can see I have an Azure preview, an Azure staging, an Azure production, and I have a staging environment for GCP and AWS for my own testing there as well. And if we just navigate into this production.azure, what you will see is we've configured some protection rules against that environment. So what that means is we can't automatically progress a deployment into that environment. It first has to be approved by this GitHub user, Chris Reddington, so myself. And then one of the other things that I've set is this Azure underscore credentials. So each of my environments has a different Azure underscore credentials secret. So I'm using principle of least privilege across those different environments. So my preview environment can only deploy into my preview infrastructure. My staging environment can only deploy into my staging infrastructure and production can only deploy into production, for example. And remember, these secrets only get pulled in when the environment is referenced by the GitHub Action Workflow. Now, one point to note at the time of this recording, the environment's functionality is available for public repositories on any of the GitHub platforms and only for private repositories in GitHub Enterprise Server. It's not available for private repositories on github.com at this time. So do bear that in mind if you're interested in some of this functionality here. So there we go, a whistle stop tour about GitHub, GitHub Actions, GitHub Code Spaces, and some of the other aspects of GitHub that can help you along your journey as you build your own applications, your own blog site or podcast site on Azure. So where do you go to learn more? Well, number one, GitHub Learning Labs is an amazing tool, an amazing platform that you can go ahead and create a repository within your own GitHub account which allows you to go and learn all the way from the fundamentals of Git, all the way through to the fundamentals of GitHub and advanced scenarios. Those scenarios are hands-on, so you will follow a series of steps through these GitHub Learning Labs and a brilliant, brilliant resource, labs.github.com. Next up then, we have Microsoft Learn as well. So hopefully you're already familiar with Microsoft Learn. And Microsoft Learn is a set of guided modules. Some of them are even learning paths. And there is also this service called Learn TV where you can go and learn wealths of information, such as things like Azure, Dynamics 365, Office 365, and of course, GitHub as well. And finally, I also have to mention my own website, cloudwithchris.com, because this is a subject I'm really passionate about. And I've done lots of content all around GitHub, around static content, around CDN and hosting these types of workloads. And I talk a lot about GitHub and DevOps principles in general, cloud architecture and also Azure in general as well. So if you've liked this talk, please go ahead, subscribe over on YouTube, Cloud with Chris, and you can follow me on Twitter as well, Red Oboin. And with that, thank you very much for watching this session as part of the Cloud Lunch and Learn Marathon.